there for now. That looks good. Okay. Hey everybody, how you doing? Teching here, and as you can already tell, this is going to be a little bit of a different kind of video. That is right. Today's video is all going to be about talking about Yu Yu Hakusho. That is right. Yoshihiro Tagashi's first major groundbreaking series in Shonen Jump released in 1990. One of my favorites of all time, very near and dear to my heart. It stars a young man by the name of Yusuke Yurameshi, who upon one day... Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, Pokemon video today! Why are we doing that, Teking? I, I'm scared. This is One Piece land. You can't go to Pokemon land and then One Piece land. Those two don't mix. I think they actually fit rather well, to be honest with you. I could see the Straw Hats all having their own little Pokemon companions, right? But in case you're curious why we're doing this, well, it all goes back to around two weeks ago when we found out that our favorite giant dragon god in One Piece turns out to be also a giant fish. And I made a video about it, and in said video, I said this. I'm gonna go level up this Magikarp. You know what? I'm not get, I'm not evolving. I'm not evolving the Magikarp. I'm getting this Magikarp to level 99, and I'm kicking ass. Has somebody probably already done that? Somebody has probably already done that before. Has probably beaten all of Pokemon Red and Blue, and probably every Pokemon game with a level 99 Magikarp. Yeah, now... I was kind of already aware, like, when I said that, I was pretty sure somebody on the internet had probably beaten Pokemon Red and Blue and probably a slew of other Pokemon games with just a Magikarp. Like, I was pretty confident that probably happened, but as you can imagine, I got a lot of comments about it, and most of them were pointing me toward a channel called JRose11, okay? And so I was like, hey, Teching, if you want to see a channel that's all about, like, hard runs of Pokemon games, specifically the classic generations, like Gen 1 and 2, which I usually, um, you know, go back and play the most, uh, go check out JRose11, because he did a run, you know, a Magikarp only run, Abra only run, a Paris only run, a bunch of different runs of a bunch of different Pokemon uh, from the original games, okay? So I wanted to shout out his channel. He just hit 200,000 subscribers, but let's see if we can get him even higher than that, because I think he makes some pretty good content. I've been binge-watching his videos for the last two weeks, so let's do a Pokemon video! Why not? Uh, but first, why not? Get it? Get it? Get it? Yeah, the puns are already rolling, okay? But but first, we need to assemble my Pokémon team of six. So, of course, my starter, my lead, really the only Pokémon I need, of course, is Barry himself. Yes, Barry is, in fact, a Pokémon, because Barry transcends all existence, so therefore he is everything and nothing at the same time. It gets confusing. Point is, he is a Pokémon, and he has every single type in every single Pokémon game in the entire franchise, as well as about 47 other types that have yet to be introduced from the far future. Because, as Barry tells me, the Pokémon franchise continues into the 26th century, even after humankind is all frozen in a giant block of ice, somehow the Pokemon franchise continues onward. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Oh, Barry has access to all these types, so he's like Arceus. No, 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 no. You don't have to swap out plates for Barry. He just is, okay? And he is the strongest, but I have five more slots to fill, so let's go through this. Uh, well, I have a skeleton spider here, a skull spider, a, uh, a, a Sklider. Yeah, we'll call him that. We'll call him Sklider. And Sklider is going to be my bug ghost type Pokemon. Yeah. Um, I actually don't think there is a bug ghost in the entirety of Pokemon. There probably is in some of the later generations, but whatever. I have a bug ghost. I also have this, um, star person. Star man! Uh, Starman. It's Starman, who is, of course, a fairy type. So Starman is gonna go up there. We got a fairy type. Uh, we also have, um, ugh! This giant shark, uh, Megalodon, but his name is Doug, so I'm gonna call him Megalodug. And he's gonna, of course, be our trusty, uh, water type. Yeah, there we go. Megalodug hanging out back there. What else do we got? Oh, we got an ice type, which just happens to be a dice. Dice. Ice type. Get it? Yeah. Um, oh, actually, wait, hold on. There we go! <laughs> there we go! Dice! We got our ice type. Okay, cool. So that brings us up to one, two, three, four, five, which our last slot will be filled with, um, let's go with a Celebi. Because it's literally a Pokemon that can control time. Is there any other Pokemon out there that can control time? Don't show me that! That is not as cool as this! Alright, this is the first Pokemon that can control time. GS Ball for life! Alright, so that's how we're gonna go here. We got... We got a Celebi, we got a Water-type Megalodug, we got a Slider, we got a Starman, we got a Dice, and we got a Berry. 
So, uh, yeah, I'll put dice up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go. This is the most balanced team in all of Pokemon. All right, so what we're actually going to be doing today, um, I, I haven't really even gotten around to saying what I'm doing yet, but we're going to be going through all of 151 original Pokemon, and I'm just going to tell you my thoughts on every single one. All right, um, you can go ahead and comment below on who your favorites are. I think this is a good thing to do. I think this is going to be fun, you know, to kind of go back that blast of nostalgia you get when talking about old school Pokemon. I remember back in the day, I used to have, it's an Ichigo poster here now, but right here in my room, I used to have a poster of all 150 original Pokemon. I remember Mew wasn't even on that one. It was just 150 from uh, Bulbasaur all the way to Mewtwo, and I would study that thing every night. I remember um, at the Scholastic Book Fair, because when I was in elementary school, we did this thing called the Book Fair, if you remember that, if you did that where you went to school, where you'd have like a company come into your school library and have like the giant cases, and they would sell books, and your parents would give you money, and you go to the school and you buy books, and uh, they, some of them were cool books, you know, they were like Pokemon encyclopedias or Pokedex kind of like, uh, kind of entries. Um, sort of like this, I bought this a few years ago. I wish I could use this for the video, but these uh, have every Pokemon in alphabetical order rather than generation, right? So I can't use this exactly but it was kind of like this back in the day where it had all of these uh, Pokemon kind of listed back in the older generations and in the anime. So that was pretty cool. It had little facts about them. I loved Pokemon growing up, right? Never really understood how to play the card game when I was a kid, but still collected the cards all the time. So, um, yeah, we're just going to go through all of them today and uh, let, let's get started with the starters. Why not? So this, of course, is a very important choice that everybody has to make at some point in their life. Uh, Squirtle, Bulbasaur, or Charmander. I'll tell you what, when I was a kid growing up, it was Squirtle. It was 100% Squirtle. Not because I necessarily liked Squirtle, but it was because of Blastoise. I gotta be honest with you, okay? Everybody was flipping out over Charizard, and I admit, Charizard is awesome! He's a giant fire dragon! I mean, why wouldn't you think Charizard is awesome? And in the anime, and the, the anime loves Charizard, alright? Yeah, Ash catches a Squirtle, a Bulbasaur, and a Charmander, but the one that evolves into Charmeleon and Charizard, yeah, that's the one. One. That's the key that they focus on, okay? I don't think Ash's Squirtle or Bulbasaur ever evolve, at least never when I watched it. You know, maybe they might have evolved later on. Oh my god, episode 1012 and Bulbasaur finally evolves into an Ivysaur. But no, they focused on Charizard. Everybody loved Charizard. Everyone wanted to get the Charizard trading card. Everybody loved him, okay? The reason I love Blastoise so damn much is the aesthetic of having the two giant cannons, the hydro pump cannons coming out of his shell. I I love that. I don't remember if I watched Digimon first or Pokemon. It was right around the same time. Although I like to think I did watch Digimon first. I'm not exactly sure which one came to the US first, okay? Um, but at any rate, I like the idea of Bulb of, of Blastoise kind of being semi like cyborg, cybernetic. It, not really cybernetic, but like it had like giant like pumps coming like hoses coming out of like its back and I, I like that idea right so I went with that instead right I always went with Squirtle it was funny because Pokemon Red was still the first Pokemon game I got for Gen 1 um, and I didn't play Blue until much later when it came out on the 3DS but um, yeah it was Squirtle and then after I finished the run with Squirtle then I went with Charmander and I only played with Bulbasaur a few times but I didn't like I didn't hate Bulbasaur I thought Bulbasaur was alright I like Venusaur Venusaur like the idea of having the whole tree on the back. I thought that was pretty cool. Also, War Turtle. Um, I liked War Turtle not as much as Blastoise, but I liked War Turtle just getting a little bigger and the fangs and uh, like the flowing cloud kind of tail, like the wispy tail, like a crashing wave. I like that aesthetic of uh, Squirtle's line way more than Charmander's line, okay? I like Charmander, but Charmander was just like, all right, it's it's a lizard and it evolves into a bigger lizard and then it evolves into a dragon, which is cool, but I've always liked Squirtle's line better, so we're just going to go with Squirtle on that front, right? And so, yeah, I took care of all the starters there. I might skip over a few of these. This is a very casual style kind of video, if you already haven't realized, okay? We're not going to be going to, like, a serious discussion on every single one. This is just me going through the 150 and talking about 151 and talking about the ones that I personally liked, what my thoughts were. All right, so moving on, we got the two bug lines. We got Caterpie and we got Weedle's line. I love Beedrill. Beedrill was awesome, which was very weird growing up because I was terrified, still kind of am, of wasps, which Beedrill is way more of a wasp or a hornet than a bee, all right? You know, English translations and all that stuff definitely resembles more of a yellow jacket. Oh my God, those things are terrifying. 
Uh, I've told this story before. When I was a little kid, when I was about seven years old, I was walking outside my house. There was a yellow jacket nest on the side of the house. I wasn't provoking them. I wasn't doing anything. Yellow jackets are just kind of assholes. And they all came out of the nest and started attacking me and started like swarming around my head and, you know, stinging me. And I ran down the street screaming in terror, okay? Uh, and so even though that was like a very traumatic moment for me growing up, I still loved Beedrill. And I would always catch a Weedle and I would always evolve it into a Beedrill. And I was always upset whenever I would have to drop Beedrill and leave him in the box because bug Pokemon in Gen 1 are relatively weak. They evolve very fast, but they're very weak overall. So Beedrill, not a very viable option for like the end game of Pokemon, uh, but I kept him around as much as I could until he can learn Twin Needle, and that was pretty cool. Um, but although I love Beedrill quite a bit, I have to say probably my favorite Pokemon out of these six, it's a tough call, but I'm going to say it's between Beedrill and Metapod. I don't know why. You're probably wondering why. Why Metapod? I don't know. It's just, he looks cool. He's green and he's shaped like a crescent moon and he's got the eyes and he just looks so damn chill. Like he just doesn't care about anything. He's just laying there like, yeah, whatever. I'm here. I'm a Metapod. Ash is like, Metapod, use Harden. He's like, yeah. Okay, I guess I'll use Harden. Nothing else I can do, Ash. Fine. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I like the the just the sleekness of uh, Metapod's design more than Kakuna. Kakuna's actually creeped me out quite a bit in the anime. The scene where they go into the Viridian Forest, right? And you see all the Kakunas. Some of them are like strung up with like um, the, 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 the string shot on the trees. And others are just kind of like latched onto the trees. D that kind of gave me this weird sort of like alien, you know, image of these things. Where like the Kakunas... And the Metapods, they could move, but they can move, like, very slow. Like, I'm picturing a Kakuna, like, slowly moving across the ground and latching onto a tree and slowly, like, moving up the tree. But it's very slow and just deliberate movements, right? And uh, Kakuna in the games actually had these giant, like, spikes that would later become, like, the Beedrill's, like, giant, like, uh, twin needle, like, arms. And uh, in the games, it was more pronounced where they would, like, come out like arms, like, coming out of Kakuna, right? Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it would be a toss-up between, um, Beedrill and Metapod as my favorites. Weedle and Caterpie never, both, never really did it for me. I was never really interested in either of them. Weedle reminded me of, a like, one of an enemy from, like, Super Mario World, which was something I played quite a bit as a kid. Probably, like, my first, you know, video game I ever really played all the way through was probably Super Mario World, and Weedle reminded me, like, one of those, uh, enemies in the game, right? And so, yeah, those are the bugs, but, uh, man, I wish I could have kept, I wish Beedrill, I wish Mega Evolutions existed in Gen 1, so I could have, like, Beedrill all the way through. I mean, yeah, you could have had Beedrill all the way through, nothing stopping you, but, um, it's just not as strong as, like, other, you know, Pokemon, right? All right, so then we have the birds. Okay, we got, um, you know what? I know it goes the Pidgey line and then the Rattata and then Spearow, but we're just gonna do the Pidgey line and the Spearow line together, okay? So didn't care much for Pidgey, and I didn't really even care much for Pidgeotto. Pidgeotto was used so much in the anime, um, and looked just so much like a regular bird, which is some really cool plumage, I guess. I just didn't really care. But Pidgeot! My God, Pidgeot was awesome! I think the reason why we just never got to see Pidgeot that much in the anime made me love Pidgeot even more. Because... Ash catches Pidgeotto pretty early on in the anime, and it's like, okay, cool, you catch him, like, before you even challenge Brock. All right, so you're definitely gonna have a Pidgeot at some point, right? No, you don't. And then, very end of the story, of the, of the Kanto arc, you get Pidgeotto finally evolving into Pidgeot, and Ash decides to leave it behind to protect all the hapless little Pidgeys and Spearows around Pallet Town. Well, isn't that just dandy? But now we don't have a Pidgeot, Ash. Does Ash ever go back for the Pidgeot? See, that's the thing I want you guys to let me know on, because I haven't watched the Pokemon anime since, oh, I, I think since Diamond and Pearl. Like, I've, I've stopped by a couple of times, you know, every generation I'll maybe watch one episode or so, like Ash when he won the, uh, the Alolan League. I went back and watched that episode, because he finally won, right? So I watched those episodes, but in the entirety of the Pokemon franchise, for anybody that's actually sat down and watched the entirety of it, does he ever go back to say hi to that Pidgeot? I need to know. But you know what? Even if he didn't, it's cool. Because that means Pidgeot is so badass, he's just flying around protecting all of Pallet Town, all right? He is the fearsome Sky Guardian. God Bird, Sky Attack, right? Yes, okay. 
Uh, Spiro and Firo. Um, Spiro, I would say, looks way more badass than Pidgey. Um, and then Firo, also pretty damn cool, you know. So I would definitely go, if I had the choice in the games, I would definitely go with the Spiro's line before Firo's line, right? Definitely. Then we got Rattata Tata Tata uh, and Raticate. I uh, never really cared much for these two. I uh, never really caught them growing up. Uh, just kind of treated them like as vermin, essentially, in the Pokemon world. Like, oh, in fact, I don't think I've ever caught a Rattata or a Raticate to use in the actual games. Uh, other than maybe just finishing out the Pokedex. Yeah, other than that, I don't think I've ever used them on my team. Uh, but I'm sure there's people out there that just love the Rattata Tata Tata. If your name is Joey, of course you love him. Uh, Ekans and Arbok. All right, cool, cool, cool. Snake and Cobra with Cobra with a K, of course. All right, uh, love them. Love that Arbok was used by Jesse. Uh, so Arbok has a technique called Glare which causes the Pokemon opposite to be paralyzed, right? That's what Glare does. And Jesse uses it, but not as much as you'd think. And, um, you know, I wish that uh, Team Rocket... I feel like if Team Rocket was a little bit more competent with Arbok and Weezing and even Meowth every now and then, um, they would at least be able to win every once in a while against, you know, the Twerps, you know? Like, that, I think, like... That would work a little bit better. I think they need. I think they were thinking too big. They were thinking too complicated with this stuff, right? Like we need to make. We need to ask Team Rocket to send us like a giant mechanical crane machine to uh, attach to the bottom of my, our Meowth balloon to capture Pikachu. Like you guys can maybe just go off and just train Weezing and Arbok to like level a hundred or whatever, and then come back, and then maybe you might have a shot here. Okay, I think you were just thinking way too hard on this, Jesse and James. I think you could have had a. Sh you had a chance to make this work, right? But I uh, really liked Arbok. Very intimidating. I've used Arbok a few times, yes. Although, I don't know if I used Arbok in red because of, uh, I don't know if it was uh, catchable in red. I think it was. Uh, but if not, I used it in blue later on when I played it on the 3DS. It might have been on that game. I can't remember. Uh, Pikachu and Raichu. Okay. Um, Pikachu's everywhere, and I'll be honest with you, even growing up, I, I never really understood the hype for Pikachu. Pikachu was essentially the icon for the entire franchise, so when you saw Pikachu, you knew immediately, oh, that's a Pokemon-related product, obviously, Pikachu was everywhere in the late 90s. In fact, just the other day, and that's kind of another impetus for making this video, the other day, I was in Walmart, and I saw Pikachu cereal, I saw Pokemon cereal with Pikachu, just like, pika pee, and I'm like, are we in 1999 again? Did I time travel? Can I also get those Pop-Tart snack sticks that I want? You know? Um, but at any rate, yeah, Pokemon cereal is back in, I guess, limited locations if you want to go check that out. Um, but yeah, Pikachu, I think, was just played out too much for me, so I just never got into, like, I, I was never a huge fan of Pikachu, even as a kid. Raichu, on the other hand... Raichu, Lieutenant Surge's Raichu especially, messed me up a few times when I was playing the games, right? That was like one of the first hurdles I had to deal with, especially since being Squirtle as a kid. Uh, Brock, no problem. Misty, eh, a little bit of a problem. You hit Lieutenant Surge and it's just like, I'm gonna Thunderbolt ya! I'm like, oh no! Right? And, um... Yeah, yeah, and you know, watching Pokemon as a kid, there was the episode when Ash also got his ass kicked by Lieutenant Surge the first time, and uh, then Nurse Joy comes out with the Thunderstone, the Thunderstone! It's like, alright, Ash, here's the Thunderstone, you use this on Pikachu, and it will evolve into a Raichu, and that was that big debate of the uh, episode, whether or not uh, Pikachu should evolve, whether or not Pikachu wants to evolve or stay the way it is, and um, as a little kid, I can definitely tell you that my thoughts on it were, ASH EVOLVED PIKACHU ALREADY! That was definitely my thoughts on it, but uh, maybe you had a different perspective on that. Of course, I know the reason why Ash didn't involve Pikachu. He is the marketing darling. He's like the chopper for One Piece for Pokemon. You know, that's just how it goes. Um, but still, in an alternate universe, be pretty damn cool. Be pretty cool. Also, the surfing Raichu in Gen 6. I, I have to say, the Alolan Raichu, that was also pretty cool. Oh, Sandshrew and Sla Sandslash. Love those guys. Love them. I don't think I ever used them as a kid. I don't think I ever caught a Sandshrew, but I I think it might have been Aloha. I think it might have been later on getting the ice versions of Sandshrew and Sandslash. Um, but I, I, I remember actually not liking Sandslash that much. I remember finding those Pokemon kind of boring growing up. But yeah, right now I have a whole 
whole new respect for those two Pokemon, definitely. All right, the Nidoran lines, male and female, Nido Queen, Nido King. Um, I remember they're used quite a bit in the games against you. I like like Giovanni, ground type trainer, loves to use Nido Queen and Nido King. Um, I never used them, never used them growing up. I don't know why. I just kind of never got around to it. I just thought I just thought there was like so many other interesting Pokemon out there um, than those ones. But yeah, never never been a big fan of them. Um. Couldn't really tell you why. I don't know. If I had to pick between the two, I'd say Nido King is probably cooler with the giant horn and everything coming out of him. Um, you know, later on they get Poison Point when abilities are introduced. Um, but I just never really use them at all. Uh, Clefairy and Clefable. All right, I really got nothing against Clefable. Clefairy was annoying as hell to me growing up. I, 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 you know, there's a lot of episodes of Pokemon I can imagine that, like, adults that were forced to watch the show by their little kids, you know, just like, oh, uh, Dad, come watch Pokemon with me. I did that a lot with my parents growing up, uh, and I'm sure they were quite annoyed, but, uh, you know, like the Doug Trio song, remember that? Like, diglet dig, diglet dig, diglet dig, trio, trio, trio. That didn't bother me. All of the Pika, 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 that didn't bother me. Clefairy's song in the Mount Moon episode, that annoyed the crap out of me for whatever reason. Really didn't like Clefairy growing up. I like Metronome. Metronome is cool. So whenever I would catch a Clefairy in the games, immediate Moonstone, get a Clefable, and Metronome. Because Metronome is, is a blast to use. I love it. Uh, but yeah, didn't care much for a Clefairy. Uh, Vulpix and Ninetales. I love those Pokemon since day one. Uh, got a Vulpix. I don't know. Could I catch Vulpix in red? I don't know. There's a lot of this I don't remember. But anyway, um, actually, I don't, I don't think you could. I really don't remember using a Vulpix growing up, and that is something I probably would definitely have used because I love Ninetales' design. So at any rate, yeah, Ninetales, gorgeous. And, uh, of course, later on, I watched Naruto, and so Kurama was in Naruto, so Ninetales, great. Um, oh, Jigglypuff. Okay, once again, I have nothing against Wigglytuff. The Gen 1 original sprite looked very disturbing with, like, the eyes that are not the same, like, size. That was very disturbing. I remember that. But, um, yeah, Jigglypuff... <sighs> very annoying introduction to the anime for that. Uh, the, the running gag with Jigglypuff, I hated. I remember, like, every single time Jigglypuff showed up in the anime with the marker and the gimmick of just, like, Jigglypuff, Jiggly, they fell asleep on me. Oh. Draw a funny face, wake up. Oh, no, Jigglypuff, why would you do this? You're tearing me apart, Jigglypuff. I just thought it always grinded the plot to a just a grinding halt, you know, and already there's a lot of filler in Pokemon. Not all the filler bothered me as a kid, but the Jigglypuff stuff always, it always just annoyed me. It's just like, oh, cool, today we're going to find out about Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan, and then Jigglypuff shows up. I don't know if Jigglypuff actually shows up in that episode, but you know what I mean? Like, there's another Pokemon of the day that we should be focusing on in this episode, but then we got to devote a few minutes to Jigglypuff showing up and doing the Jigglypuff song. I'm like, I, I didn't like that. Every time Jigglypuff showed up, I'm like, go go away. We already know about you. You sing things. We know, all right? Wigglytuff. I don't think Wigglytuff. Did Wigglytuff even really have any kind of prominence in the, in the Indigo League in Kanto? I don't remember, but got nothing against you, Wigglytuff, but Jigglypuff, yeah. No, no. Zubat and Golbat. All right. Zubat, annoying as hell. Understandably annoying, but also wanted me to catch one so I can also use what made it annoying on my opponents, right? So yes, Zubat's always annoying in every single cave you're in, and they know Supersonic, and Golbat knows Confuse Ray, and those moves are very annoying. So you catch one, you evolve it into Golbat, you get freaking Supersonic and eventually Confuse Ray, and then you use it on your opponent. One of my favorite moves to use, all right? Definitely. Uh, probably better from something like Gengar or Ghost, you know, Poison type later on, uh, but definitely like like Golbat. And one of my staples, whenever I'm playing a Gen 2 game or up, always catch a Zubat and always get a Crobat at some point, because Crobat, fast as hell. So, yeah, love me, love me the Zubat line. Oddish line. Oddish, Gloom, and Vileplume. Um... Don't really got anything against them, honestly. Uh, Erica used Vileplume, of course. Um, just never really sparked an interest with me. I thought there were more interesting grass types out there. Definitely would go with um, the Bell Sprout line up to Victory Bell rather than the Oddish line. Um, yeah, they're they're all right. Got nothing against them, but not really a huge fan. Uh, Paris and Parasect. Okay, so these two 
were the first that actually I remember being actively kind of disturbed by Pokemon lore. Uh, the lore involving Paris is Paris has this mushroom growing on its back, and eventually the mushroom gets so damn big, it actually takes over the Pokemon's mind. So when it evolves into Parasect, its pupils go white, and it's just a zombie. And that got me interested in it, so I read up on it. Keep in mind, as a kid, I'm reading up on this stuff, and I read up about those parasites that can invade, like, praying mantises or insects or whatever, and turn them into, like, basically mindless zombies for the parasite to control, right? So I remember that actively disturbing me, like, looking at parasects just dead eyes and just being like, that, that is no longer a being that is, you know, controlled under its own power. That is something that is being controlled by a parasitic life form leached on its back. And that always, always kind of disturbed me as a kid. So, yeah. Um, I have used Parasect a few times. Venonat and uh, Venomoth. Okay, so I remember the Koga episode. Um, Koga was always my favorite gym leader in Gen 1. Uh, he's a ninja, for God's sake. Why wouldn't I love Koga, right? Koga was pretty damn cool. I liked Venonat in the English version. Venonat had this very, like, uh, distorted kind of uh, voice, like, Venonat! And it was, like, distorted with, like, this reverb effect. So I like that. And uh, I like Venomoth, too. Um, yeah, I don't think I ever really used them, but Koga used them. And I remember thinking Koga was really badass. So by just extension there, we have... Um, yeah, we have Venonat and Venomoth being cool. Diglett and Dugtrio. Always love those. Remember all the times I would be in Diglett Cave running back and forth like Diglett, 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 Dugtrio! I'm gonna catch one! I got away. Diglett, Diglett, Diglett. Always tried to get a Dugtrio as soon as I could in the game. Really awesome ground-type Pokemon. And of course, if you're gonna teach Dig to any Pokemon, well, I think Diglett actually learns Dig naturally, so you don't actually have to teach at the TM for Dig, but... Still, very handy Pokemon to have, and I remember the song, you know, Diglett Dig, Diglett Dig, Diglett Dig, Trio, Trio, Trio. The Diglett and Doug Trio Trio, man. And also just a lot of the fan art out there on the internet of what Diglett looks like under the ground, and just, I'm curious. Like, if I lived in the Pokemon world and I saw a Diglett, I'd be like, I need to, hold on, figure this out here. Would it be, like, anything underneath it? Would it immediately die? Would I pick it up and would it scream? Like, ah, I'm sorry! <laughs> you know? Or would its real body just be so gargantuan, so blood-curdling terrifying that it would just look into my eyes and suck out my soul before I could even think about ripping it out of the ground? I'm not sure. Meowth and Persian. Um, I love Meowth as the sidekick of Team Rocket. I wish Meowth would get involved in battles a little often. I remember there were only a few times in the series where Meowth actually realized, wait a second, I'm a Pokemon too. I, ca I can't use, I can't do the Meowth voice. Uh, I'm a Pokemon too. I can use Scratch and Bite. I have Pokemon moves. Um, what I also would be finding it funny is a lot of times in the story, Team Rocket doesn't have any money. They're kind of destitute. Uh, like they're like going around from town to town and sometimes they'll they'll complain like headquarters hasn't hasn't send them any money because they're blunderers they keep they keep screwing up right so i always find it funny like they have a meowth meowth knows payday a move that literally generates money somehow <laughs> i don't know how it works but it generates money in the game you hit an opponent with payday and then the opponent gives you more money after it like does it literally give, like, does it generate more money? Like, you just use the attack and coins just, yeah, coins scatter everywhere. That's what it is. And you pick up the money at the end of it. So, I don't know if it's like you use payday and it's like a magnet and everybody that's around you within, like, a one-mile radius, like, some coins just fly out of their pockets and land there. I'm like, damn it, someone's using a Meowth again, right? But, um, yeah, I don't know how that move works, but I love using payday. I would catch a Meowth just to use payday just because I wanted to use the attack, and then I really wouldn't use Meowth beyond that. Um, Psyduck and Golduck. Psyduck in the anime, I was a little annoyed by. Not as much as Jigglypuff, but sometimes the Psyduck shtick would go on a little bit too long. Now, don't get me wrong. Like, when Psyduck would get its head crushed and always go into, like, the crazy psionic powers, like, Akira mode, that was always cool. But, you know, I just feel like the running gag between Psyduck and Misty, it, it's the same thing with the running gag with uh, Jigglypuff. It just went on a little bit too long. I might have found it funny the first, like, seven times they did it, but after a while, it started to just get, you know, it just get played out there. Uh, but the payoff was always good. Uh, Mankey and Primate. Love that episode. That was the episode where we got Mankey. Well, no. No, I think there was the episode where Ash catches the Primate separately, 
and then later on the the fighting tournament episode with uh, Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan. Yeah, those were separate episodes. Yeah, the Prime Ape episode and the Mankey episode that was the one with the jelly donuts. I remember that. Hey Ash, you're down on yourself. Have yourself a good rice bowl. I mean jelly. I mean onigiri. I mean jelly donut onigiri rice bowl. Right, of course. Um, that was one of the first examples. Charmeleon, of course, was another one in the anime where uh, Ash catches a Pokemon that doesn't obey him, or it's kind of like it's like. Boop, boop, boop. Oh. Okay, we get boop, boop. Oh, oh, okay, it's still going. Oh, okay. And uh, something I always wondered about that is just like, well, Ash, you're just kind of a crappy trainer. Get more badges, and then Pokemon will listen to you. Or spend some time with the Pokemon. Get to know their soul. Ash just wasn't really a great trainer. <laughs> like, let's just be straight up here. They took the kid, like, what, 20-something years to finally win a league? I mean, come on, man. I know he won Orange Island, but... Eh. All right. I mean, he is perpetually 10 years old, so I guess I got to give him some slack there, right? Okay. Uh, what's next after uh, Primate? Oh, Growlithe and Arcanine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Love Arcanine. I remember in the, one of the first episodes of the anime, they depict Arcanine as a legendary uh, amidst the uh, legendary birds on that um, that plaque thing in the Viridian Pokemon Center because it's like they had to split them up into four and I guess they couldn't spoil Mewtwo or Mew uh, so they had to go with the three legendary birds and I guess, you know, I would have used Dragonite. I would have thrown Dragonite in there uh, but no, they used Arcanine instead because Arcanine is a legendary uh, species of Pokemon and uh, Growlithe was cool but Arcanine was always this very regal, kingly kind of Pokemon that could just incinerate wherever you stand and that was really cool to me. Uh, love Poliwag's line. That was always my go-to water type beyond Squirtle. Like, if I was doing Pokemon, if I was doing a Charmander or Bulbasaur run instead, I would always go Poliwag. Um, it didn't even bother me that I didn't have a lot of friends growing up to trade into a Poliwhirl. Didn't even bother me because I thought Poly, I mean Poly, a uh, Wrath. Poliwhirl was always the coolest to me out of these three. Okay, so get Poliwag, evolve into Poliwhirl. You know it can evolve one more time if you, you know, trade it. I'm like, no, 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 no. Once again, I didn't have any friends to trade with growing up. And I didn't, well, if I did, I didn't have anybody that had the link cable. So, and I never did that growing up. But um, didn't care because Poliwhirl was the coolest. I was a Poliwhirl for Halloween one year. Why did I just admit that? I remember I was in second grade. I went to a uh, Halloween party one of my classmates was throwing. All my classmates were there from second grade, Mrs. Mastrini's class, and I was a damn Poliwhirl. It was like a foam outfit. It was huge. It was just a foam outfit, like two sheets of foam that you would like put on yourself and then like foam gloves. I'll, I'll throw a picture up if I can find it out there somewhere. But yeah, I was a Poliwhirl and I was proud of it. Damn it. All right. So uh, Abracadabra and Alakazam. Um, I did not have the patience for Abra. I would have loved to get a Kadabra and eventually an Alakazam if I knew anybody that could trade. But... I just didn't have the patience to catch an Abra and be like, well, how does this work? doesn't attack. doesn't learn anything. Um, I think it can learn TMs, but I never bothered doing that because I was a dumb kid growing up. So I was just like, yeah, this is, this is too much work. Screw this. And so that was that. Um, but I liked Abra. Uh, very, very creepy uh, in the Sabrina episodes of the anime. That that was that was kind of some semi-nightmare fuel. That was actually probably some straight-up nightmare fuel with Sabrina and the little girl and the doll and da ah, yeah. And then just Abra. Abra is genuinely creepy as hell in that episode. Abra in the game is just like, oh, it's an Abra. All I can do is teleport. <laughs> like that one rival battle where you're fighting Gary or Blue or whoever. Uh, I threw out an Abra, man. This is going to be easy. In the anime, it's just like, Abra, banish them. <laughs> It'll banish them to another realm. <sighs> then it just slowly opens its eyes and teleports everyone away. Oh, God. That's terrifying. But yeah, uh, Alakazam. I remember that little Pokemon data book I had as a kid and always reading about Alakazam. I wonder if it's in this one. I'll, I'll pull it up because um, that wouldn't be too head right there. Alakazam. Uh, let's see. Because its brain never stops growing, Alakazam must use telekinesis to hold up its heavy head. On the plus side, its memory and intellect are amazing. So it doesn't say it in here, but I remember one of the first versions of the book, or maybe in the Pokedex, it said Alakazam's brain was smarter than even a supercomputer. And that just, like, blew my mind, right? Like, as a kid. Like, so it's really smart. It's like, so wait, if it's really smart... Why is it letting itself be used to fight? Like, you think, like, it's like, my intellect dwarfs you, yours, human. I can control the world if I demand to. But you caught me in a ball, so I guess I'll just... Maybe that's, like, the master plan of Alakazam. Like, Alakazam lets itself be... It's, it's all right. I will fight alongside you, human, for now. 
but soon. <laughs> You know, uh, soon. All right. Uh, Machop line. Um, I like them. I like Machamp, of course. Just the Goro forearmed like appearance later on. Ben 10, I was a big fan of. Uh, forearms, the alien also kind of harkens back to, you know, Machamp a little bit. I think inspired forearms, the alien. Question. Always a question I've had ever since I was a kid. Um, so the belt. Is it part of the Machop biology? I'm just genuinely curious. Is the Machop biology, when it involves into Machoke, it gets the P belt, the belt with a P. Is it part of its, like, flesh, or can it take it off? Why is it a P? Why that insignia specifically that looks so much like a trademark symbol that you would see on, like, a corporation or a billboard or something always confused me so much hold on is there something in the book <laughs> is there anything in the book that maybe explains this all right hold on um meta champ man there's a lot of poke you ever realize there's a lot of pokemon this is only up to gen 6 i think too this is only up to 700 um oh uh, okay here, here we go here we go machoke yeah yeah so the the p belt it's a specific p Machoke never stops training, even when they have jobs helping people with heavy labor. They spend their free time building up their muscles. So Machop doesn't have the belt, um, and uh, but Machoke and Machamp do. Um, yeah, I I'm I'm just curious. Though it is a master of the martial arts, Machamp sometimes gets its forearms tangled up when trying to do more intricate tasks. That just imagine that just makes me think of a Machamp trying to knit or use a loom or something like Machamp. Oh, 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 dang it, sorry, I'm, I'm new with this, you know? Um, but yeah, that's that's a question I've always had. Uh, Bellsprout line. I said earlier I would definitely pick Bellsprout's line over Oddish's line. Uh, I remember there was that scene in the anime where James had a Weepin' Bell, but it was, like, never mentioned where he got a Weepin' Bell. Uh, no, I think it was mentioned he had a Weepin' Bell when he was a little kid, because James was, like, this really, uh, wealthy kid growing up. Uh, but I also think it evolved off-screen to a Victory Bell. That was a little weird. I was a little confused by that. Like, did I miss an episode where we Weepin' Bell evolves into Victory Bell? But, yeah, uh, the whole idea of it being, like, uh, not Venus Flytrap exactly, but a similar kind of flower that, uh, is really tall, and I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but it's a flower that's super tall, you know, but it has, like, nectar coming down on the insides, which attracts, uh, insects, very similar to the way a, a Venus flytrap operates, and they go down, and then it gets closed, and they get stuck inside, or they fall, and they can't get back out again. So, yeah. Uh, Tentacool and Tentacruel. Uh, I always found Tentacool very annoying in the games. Like, it's kind of in the same line with, like, they are the Rattatas of the sea. You know, they are the Rattatas of the sea, and I didn't really care. Tentacruel, though, I always thought was really badass. The giant kaiju Tentacruel that was, like, psionic in the anime. Does Tentacruel only learn any psychic moves in the actual, like, games? Is that a thing? I don't remember Tentacruel. It's not a water psychic Pokemon. I'm pretty sure it's not anyway. I don't think I'm that out of touch. Um, let's see. Tentacruel, jellyfish Pokemon. Um, does it not? Oh, yeah. Water poison. Yeah, it's not a psychic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it learn psychic moves? Can you teach it psychic moves? Because I thought that was always weird. Um, conflict. Uh, reflect. Ring out. Poison sting. Supersonic. Constrict. Acid. No, I don't see any. I don't see. Uh, you, can, you can learn Screech and Hex. Hex is kind of. And I don't know. But at any rate, yeah. Tentacruel was really cool. I love the giant, like, gems it kind of had on its body. Uh, but the tentac uh, Tentacruel was just not very cool. Uh, Geodude's line. All right. Geodude was all right. Golem, I never could get, unfortunately. I wish I could have caught a Golem. Graveler was always my favorite. I loved Graveler. I loved the the forearm design, except it had, like, the two arms up here and just the two kind of little tiny arms, like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, like, down here. And it, like, rolled down the mountains. Graveler was always my favorite out of that line. Um, but, yeah. Always wish I could catch a Golem, but unfortunately, I could not. In fact, I remember this little piece of trivia. I believe Golem is the only Pokemon in red and blue, or at least red, where unless you trade and evolve it for, with another, you know, the way you get a golem, you won't even see golem's uh, sprite in the game because no other trainer in the game will use it. So even if you can't trade for an Alakazam or a Gengar or a Machamp, there are trainers that use them, right? Um, uh, Gary or Blue, your rival, will use an Alakazam. Agatha will use a Gengar. Bruno will use a Machamp. So those are Pokemon you can only get by trading, but you can still see their sprites in the game. I don't think anybody uses a Golem on you in the game 
So unless you're using a cheat code or a game shark or something, um, unless you trade a graveler and get it that way, you will never even see what golem looks like. I remember not seeing a golem in the game until way later when I finally could look it up online or I could play the game. I could cheat and like with an emulator or something. And I'm like, oh shit, I remember being surprised. Like that's what golem sprite looks like. Okay, cool. But yeah, uh, Ponyta and Rapidash. Rapidash. So beautiful. Remember that dude in Viridian? Not Viridian, Vermilion. Remember the dude in the Pokemon fan club that just really, 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 really loved his Rapidash? Like, oh god, this Rapidash is so beautiful and fiery and magnificent. I'll, I'll give it to you, man. You know, Rapidash is pretty awesome. Very fiery Pokemon. Rapidash is cool. I like Rapidash. Yeah. Uh, Slowpoke and Slowbro. All right. Uh, the thing I love about them is I love the idea of a shelter biting down on the Slowpoke and becoming the, the seashell on Slowbro's tail, right? Um, I also was curious, like, if you take off the, like, that thing is like, it's, it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship there, right? So if you take off the shell, could, in theory, that version of Shelder, would it revert back to its original or would it stay the same? So there's Shelder right there, and then Shelder bites on to Slowbro, Slowpoke evolves into Slowbro, Okay, like, could you remove the shelter and would the shelter be stuck like that? Like, so that's like a, like another weird kind of version between shelter and, um, cloister. That always kind of bugged me. And then we get mega slow, bro, which is just more shell. That's, that's funny. Um, slow king was pretty cool as well in, in gen two. I wish I could have gotten a slow king in gen two. Um, you know, so yeah, yeah, I like that though. I, I find that more fascinating. That part I find more fascinating with the shelter than actually slow bro or slow poke themselves. Um, uh, Magnemite and Magneton. Love them too. And actually, so it's Farfetch'd first and then it's Doduo and Dodrio. But I believe both Magneton and Dodrio, uh, they can learn Tri-Attack. And Tri-Attack is one of the coolest sounding techniques in the game next to Zap Cannon. I love Zap Cannon. And then there's also uh, Tri-Attack, okay? And I was really bummed out in Gen 1, and I didn't find this out until a lot later. But Tri-Attack sucks. I mean, Tri-Attack isn't a great attack already, but in Gen 1, it really sucks. Because I think it's just like a normal type move that doesn't even do anything other than just damage. But in later games, it's like, okay, it's a move that can either burn, paralyze, or freeze your opponent right except the rate of it doing that is very very low it's like six percent it's like six or seven percent to do any of those i thought it would be awesome like why not just make try attack a move maybe this is a little bit too overpowered i don't know i'm not a pokemonologist i'm not a master of the games or whatever i would love if try attack was just okay it's an attack that does base damage no matter what and then it's just 33.3 on what a thing it's going to do like it always either does a paralyze a burn or a freeze okay and it does base damage on top of that and it could still miss or whatever you don't have to give it 100 percent accuracy or whatever so maybe dip its accuracy a little bit give it always a decent amount of damage and then have one of those three effects that's what i thought tri attack should always do but it never did that, so unfortunately. But yeah, Magnemite and Magneton, I love the episode where they were in the industrial complex and you got to see them show up too. That always fascinated me, a Pokemon that was kind of organic, I guess, has to be organic, but also mechanical. And, and that just like, how does evolution work in this world? That was the first thing to make me question that, really. Farfetch'd. Let me look up Farfetch'd really quick because I want to see if it says this in Farfetch'd is uh, entry in here. Because it was, I was confused by something as a kid. All right, Farfetch'd always carries its trusty plant stock. Sometimes two of them will fight over a superior stock. It's a sentence I never thought I'd say in my life. All right, so it doesn't say it in here. I believe there was a Pokedex entry, and probably it had to be a Pokedex entry for Farfetch'd, where it says something like, Farfetch'd makes a very delicious meal, uh, implying like roast duck like you could kill the far-fetched and cook it and it would be delicious and it comes with its own garnish with the stock okay i was such a I, I was so naive when i was a kid i thought that meant far-fetched was a good chef i thought it meant that this duck pokemon <laughs> this duck pokemon you would catch it and then it would cook food for you like you catch the far-fetched it would put a chef's hat on and be like far-fetched and then like 
make can, can you make some delicious stew tonight like far fetched and it would go out and buy the food and like cook the food and like use the stock as like a spoon and like cook food for you and be like wow this pokemon is so helpful everybody should have a far fetched <laughs> oh god <laughs> and then it wasn't until later i'm like no no that that probably means that they're going to to kill the far fetched like it would make a very delicious meal with a side of uh, rice oh yeah by the way random tangent the iced tea that i drink in all my videos all the time whenever you see me drinking something it's always iced tea right they changed the bottle design 20 something years same bottle design they changed it <sighs> same it's the same iced tea i always drink but they changed the bottle design. Okay, what's next? Um, already talked about Doduo and Dozrio. Um, there's still a lot of these left. I did not over. I kind of oversaw it how 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 long this was going to go for. But whatever, keep going. Seal and Dugong. Eh, they're cool. I, I I wish I had more stuff to say. I I just never. I didn't hate them. It, it's kind of in the same thing with uh, the Oddish family. It's just like eh, they're okay. Um, Grimer and Muck. Um, I like the idea of there just being, like, a giant goo blob Pokemon. I don't know why, but I thought that was just, like, cool. It's just, like, it's a giant glob that, like, gwomps you, like, muck! And then that's what it does, and it's a poison. There's poison type that exists. What better way to exemplify that better than a giant sludge ball Pokemon? So... I don't got any problems with Muck. I thought Muck... I, I thought it was one of the smartest moves on Ash's... Uh, in Ash's mind to swap out Muck and use it in the um, the uh, Pokemon League, in the Indigo Plateau, in in, 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 in uh, Kanto, um, against the Bellsprout. I thought that was a genius idea. Like, yeah, you have a pretty high-level Muck that was the boss of all these Grimers. Yeah. Uh, Shelter and Cloyster already kind of talked about that. Um, so yeah, Shelter's pretty cool. The tongue is constantly sticking out, so that looks like, I don't know, it would just be painful if it got stuck on something. And I like Cloyster a lot as well. Uh, Cloyster, though, it always kind of bummed me out whenever I found out that, like, yeah, Cloyster, it's, it's, uh, defense is amazingly high. Special defense sucks. And I'm like, but it's a Cloyster! It's a shell! It's like, yeah, but special is different than, yeah, I know, but it's a shell! I'm like, so yeah. Um, then we get to the ghosts. All right. Who could forget that episode where Ash and the gang make a trip to Pokemon Tower? That was always a good one. You know, I love that episode because it really just shows that Ghastly and Haunter and Gengar are all just part of one big family that just live in the Pokemon Tower. And they just live for whenever humans would wander into their home. And they wouldn't hurt them. They would just, like, screw with them, right? They would just mess with them and be like, Oh my god, some more humans are wandering in the Pokemon Tower. This is gonna be so much fun tonight. We're gonna mess with them. We're gonna turn the lights on and off. We're gonna have chandeliers moving around. They're gonna hear weird voices. We're just gonna genuinely mess with them the entire night. That's where they get their yucks. That's what, that's what makes them want to live as ghosts, right? I love that. Always wish I could have gotten a Gengar growing up, but Haunter's Gen 1 Sprite, pretty damn scary, pretty cool, pretty awesome, badass there. Um, so I definitely used Haunter quite a few times when I could get a chance to catch a Haunter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, love the ghost types. Uh, Gen 1, okay, get this. Okay, this is how badass Agatha is, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Agatha decided to be a ghost type trainer in a generation that had no pure ghost type Pokemon. <laughs> Agatha was awesome, all right? She's like, yeah, I'm gonna be a ghost trainer and I'm gonna basically set up a graveyard in the Indigo Plateau as my, as my arena. Like, you fight against uh, Laurel Lee, and it's like, okay, there's a, you know, there's a giant pool in her area because she's ice and water. Okay, cool. And then you go fight Bruno, and it's like rocks. It's like a fighting dojo. Like, you face Bruno now. And it's like, okay, cool. And then you literally step through the door into a freaking graveyard. I imagine there's like, you know, there's maybe grass or something. I know not in the games, but like I'm picturing it like grass and these creepy tombstones. And like it's still indoors. It's still an arena, but there's like creepy fog everywhere. And Agatha's there just like, <laughs> welcome now to my domain. You know, so yeah, that, yeah, pretty creepy. That was the image I had of it growing up anyway. Uh, Onyx. All right. So 
Onyx is a giant rock snake, and uh, I love Onyx. I've used Onyx a few times as well. I was always bugged by the fact that, okay, how many times in the story do Team Rocket capture Brock, Misty, and Ash in some kind of convoluted contraption? They, ca they catch them in a cage or something, right? Sometimes the cage is electrified, so they can't get out. But I always sit there half the time and like, Brock, Brock, you have a, a giant, like, five-ton rock snake. Surely that would be useful in a lot of scenarios, right? Like, just, like, not even, like, attacking with it. Just, like, oh, no, Team Rocket has caught us in a cage. Onyx. How, how heavy is Onyx? How, how long is Onyx? Let's... Let's pull that up on the, on the Pokedex. Oh, shit. Did anybody also have the Pokedex growing up? Like, the plastic Pokedex? I think you could probably buy them on eBay. They're probably not that expensive. But, yeah, like, not... It, I, I was so bummed out it didn't talk to you. It was just, like, you had to, like, push the button, like, eh, 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 to find the Pokemon that you wanted to read up on. Yeah, yeah, that, that was that was, that was was crazy. All right, that's Amistar. All right, Onyx. Okay, Onyx is 28 feet tall! Onyx is like five techings stacked on top of each other, and it weighs 463 pounds converted to kilograms, whatever metric that is. That feels like that should be useful. Like, you could use that in a lot of scenarios. It has a giant spike horn coming out of its head. You know, maybe you could use that at some point, Brock, but, you know, not really. Defeated by a sprinkler system. Drowsy and Hypno. Uh, that episode where they, uh, they used the hypnosis with the kids, I always thought that was a really weird thing that they were doing. That I, I can't remember the episode exactly, but I remember they were, like, using Drowsy's hypnosis to lure kids into that tower. And then use, uh, no, no, use Hypno for that, and use Drowsy to consume the dream. It was a very creepy episode, so I'm just gonna move on here, but I never really cared much for those two. Krabby and Kingler! Oh, yeah! All right. I love Krabby. Krabby was a plucky little crab. You gotta give him that much. He wasn't a mechanical crab, but he tried, all right? Um, I love, one of my favorite episodes is the Bill Lighthouse episode. I thought it was very creepy, um, just because of the, the spooky whale song of the Dragonite and everything, and just the when Bill is talking about all the Pokemon that exist in the world. That is, that is a beautiful scene in the Pokemon anime. Go back and watch it if you can, uh, where they're in the lighthouse, and it's this very spooky atmosphere, and Bill is just showing all the Pokemon that exist on the computer screen, and Ash is looking at all of them, and he's like, and Bill is also saying, like, these are only the Pokemon we've found. There are so more out in the world. And this is, of course... This is right when Gen 2 was about to roll out, so I knew Gen 2 was coming. But that is a perfect, perfect, like, foreshadowing and symbolism that, like, this is only the beginning. 150, this is just the start. There are going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more of these creatures throughout decades of this franchise to come. This is only the beginning, right? And it was a very haunting episode, but it was also the episode where Ash caught Krabby, and he sees the Krabby on the shore, and he's like, I'm gonna catch this Krabby all by myself! And Krabby's like, bring it on! And they cue, they cue the epic Pokemon theme, like, dun 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 and it's just, it's just a crab. It's a tiny little crab! But Ash is, like, going full throttle with this. He's like, come on, Krabby! Ugh! And he catches a Krabby. And then, of course, Kingler. Kingler is awesome for one single reason. For one single word. It might be hyphenated. I don't remember. Crab Hammer! Boom! You get yourself a Kingler and you use Crab Hammer. That is what you do. And then Hyper Beam, too. Just this giant claw. Love that. Uh, Voltorb and Electrode. Uh, Electrode is the fastest Pokemon, uh, fastest base speed in Gen 1, correct? Uh, very fast ball, lightning ball, zipping around. Um, I always love the idea of it being a Pokeball, and I think that is canon. Isn't that canon that basically it's a Pokeball that malfunctioned or something? I remember there was also a theory that it was a Pokeball that was possessed by a Haunter, because, uh, Haunter's eyes and, uh, Voltorb's eyes are very similar, so I always thought that was a cool origin story for Voltorb. Uh, same thing with Magnemite and Magneton. Like, how do these mechanical kind of Pokemon evolve? How do they exist, right? How do they reproduce? Questions I'd never really thought very much of uh, until I started putting way too much thought into all this. Um, but yeah. Ugh. Megalodug, you're falling down. All right. All right, don't worry. Don't worry, you're going to be okay, buddy. You're going to be okay. All right, what's next? Um, execute and Exeggutor. 
Exeggutor. I liked Exeggutor. Exeggutor always reminded me of Ed from Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Just Ed. Just tall guy, simple kind of just character, you know? Exeggutor. <laughs> I am Ed. Buttered toast. I don't know why I always thought of the two as like kindred spirits, but if Ed was ever going to have a Pokemon, I think it would be an Exeggutor. I just feel like that. Um... Yeah, yeah, I think I used execu uh, exe yeah, Execute a few times in the games. Um, let's see. I know I used an Executor and a Lone Executor in my run of that, and then run of, uh, of my uh, Moon run. Yeah, I definitely used that. As well as up next, we have Cubone and Marowak. Um, so this is all part of, like, the Kangaskhan lore, that Cubone is the child, and then Marowak the mother, but also Kangaskhan, also the child could be a, a baby uh, Cubone. And I think, I, I don't know if this is fan art or whatever, but I was reading an article a few days ago about uh, some scrapped Pokemon content concepts from gen 1 and gen 2 that you know they found finally in the source code after years and um i think the original line was supposed to go cubone marowak kangaskhan and then they switched it around so it's just cubone marowak and then kangaskhan as like its own separate thing but the comparisons are definitely there uh you can't overlook them there uh the little story arc in the games and it's not in the anime uh i think it might have been a little bit too dark but in the uh in the in the in the game i remember the story arc with the mother you know marowak being killed and then you know the q bone is sad and lonely that that always when i was a kid just like how the whole thing with parasect kind of creeped me out the thing with uh that also kind of made me a little sad growing up like oh the mother died um, Hitmon Lee and Hitmon Chan. Which one are you? Which one are you a more fan of? I would say I love Hitmon Chan with the elemental punches. Uh, just the fact you can do a fire punch, an electric punch, an ice punch. Love that. But I would probably say a Hitmon Lee high jump kick is definitely my fave. Definitely my fave I would go to uh, more than the Hitmonchan. I think I, I went with Hitmonlee a lot more in the Fighting Dojo. And uh, I love the episode, of course, in the um, in the anime as with the, uh, the fighting tournament they had there. That was a pretty good one. Um, I don't know if you could do it in Gen 1, but I know High Jump Kick is one of the few moves that you can actually use to hurt flying Pokemon. So if you have a, an opponent that uses Fly and you have a high jump kick, that can injure the flying Pokemon. At least, I know at least in some iteration it can do that. I'm not 100% sure um, in the Gen 1, but maybe. Lickitung always disturbed me. Moving on. Uh, coughing and wheezing. I like wheezing. Uh, you know, I, I guess in the actual... How th does James ever use self-destruct or explosion? Is that ever explained? I think it's used a few times in the anime. The Pokemon doesn't actually die, of course. Um, it just blows up, and then it just gets knocked out, bring it to a Pokemon Center. It's fine. Um, but, yeah, I feel like at, at some point, at any point, it's like when Team Rocket's fighting against, uh, you know, Ash or whatever, and they really want that Pikachu. I'm just like, all right, Weezing, you're going to have to do it. Take one for the team, buddy. Weezing, we Explosion! <laughs> Grab the Pikachu! <laughs> Weezing, it's okay, you're gonna be okay, buddy. I don't know how it explodes and doesn't, like, get blown to pieces, but, you know, that's... Yeah, Weezing was cool. I love the top-hatted variety later on. The gentlemanly uh, Weezing I love, which is actually... It might be in this. Um, no, it's not in this, so that means... No, that, that's the Galarin version. Yeah, this isn't Galarin. Yeah, I thought that was a Loan for a second. Yeah, that's not that. Um, all right, what's next? After Weezing, we have... Uh, oh, Rhyhorn and Rhydon. Okay, so Rhydon, first Pokemon ever designed. Uh, ever, ever drawn. Uh, so that was really cool. Um, I like Rhyhorn a little more, though. I like the more bony appearance of Rhyhorn. I think it's more terrifying, the fact it's on all fours, and it's like a, it's like a freaking rhinoceros. It's going to ram into you, except the thing is going to be even more tough. It has this really thick carapace, uh, this bony carapace that can just, like, shred you or hit you, and just, you know, it would really, it would just break every bone in your body. I thought it was more threatening, anyway. Uh, but Ry Rhydon was really cool as well. Um, I remember that one scene where they did the Pikachu, like, aim for the horn! Pikachu. I'm like, that actually worked. Okay, whatever. Uh, let's see. Chansey. Um, I got nothing against Chansey. Chansey, I just remember as being that really, it was like rare. You know, you run into Chansey in the Safari Zone. Like, oh, that's so, oh, don't run into those all the time. That's cool. Uh, and it's a very tanky Pokemon. Has a lot of HP. Um, but yeah, beyond that, not a huge fan of Chansey. And Tangela. Tangela probably takes the prize for the most boring Pokemon in Gen 1 to me, anyway. Um, yeah, I never caught a Tangela, never cared much for a Tangela. 
Yeah, Tangela. I'm sorry, Tangela. I, I feel bad, but, you know, I always found Tangela kind of boring. Uh, what's next? We have Kangaskhan, as I said. I remember the Kangaskhan kid. I think, like, one of the only Safari Zone episodes that survived in the anime because of Kaiser and the gun, remember? So that Dratini episode had to be... <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is the reason we can't have nice things, you know? It's, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Kangaskhan, though... It was, it was a cool design and basically like you know basically taking on a marsupial like uh like a kangaroo you know that was neat uh horsey and uh uh, uh not sea king horsey and um brain hey brain horsey evolves into what i know kingdra Cedra. there we go there we go hey brain i know we've been at this for a while but come on buddy <laughs> come on brain Horsey and Seedra. All right. So yeah, Horsey. Cute, adorable little seahorse Pokemon. Evolves into a badass dragon. Lance should have had a Seedra. I think Lance should have definitely had a Seedra. Yeah, absolutely. You can maybe swap out Aerodactyl. I mean, yeah, or maybe maybe Gyarados. I don't know. I know what you would swap out. Okay, if it was a choice between a Gyarados or a Seedra, I guess you had to go with a Gyarados for Lance in Gen 1, but... Cedra, Cedra would have been a pretty cool option too. Yeah, and then Kingdra, love Kingdra. Kingdra is awesome. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the time, even though I'm not even talking about Gen Two Pokemon. By the way, let me know if you like this. I don't know if this is like appealing to anybody right now. Just me talking about Pokemon for an hour. But um, if you do, I mean, some people tell me, you know, checking, I watch your videos while playing video games or while I'm trying to go to bed just to have something on in the background. Like, so I guess this is a perfect video for you where I just go through every single Pokemon, right? Um, but yeah, let, let me know if you like this, and, uh, what the hell is a Carablast? Anyway, let me know if you like this, and then, um, I'll maybe do this for Gen 2. I, I could do this for Gen 2 and 3 at least, because those are the games I played and I love the most growing up. Gen 4 is where I stopped playing the games. I didn't play Gen 4 and 5 until much later, and then Gen 6 and 7 and 8 is when I finally got back into buying the games when they're new. So, yeah, but, but let me know. All right, Kingdra, look at the beauty. Oh, and Kingler, Kingler, check that out. Perfect. These two Pokemon are right here on the same page. That is awesome. You got a Kingdra, you got a Kingler. Yes. Kingdra makes its home so deep in the ocean that nothing else lives there. It wants its space. It's too awesome to be witnessed. Some people think its yawn influences the currents, which it does. So yeah, love Kingdra and Cedra, even though I forgot Cedra's name. Okay, what's next? Uh, we got Goldeen and we got uh, Sea King. Uh, Goldeen was always bland to me. Goldeen was just like, oh, it's just a fish. Just a fish with a horn. All right. And then Sea King, I only really like Sea King because of horn drill. Because the one I love one-hit KO moves. And so Sea King, does, does, I guess Goldeen could learn horn drill as well. I'm assuming it could. But Sea King, just a bigger fish. So, yeah, I like that. Um, Star You and Star Me. I love Star You. I'm going to take the time to pull them up on here. Star You and Star Me. They're, they're my faves as well. Um, love that aspect. Once again, they're not really... I mean, like, star, you know, starfish are biological, but these things also seemed kind of robotic to me. They seemed, like, uh, mechanical in a sense. I always just liked... I, I don't know what their sound effects were in the Japanese of the anime, but I remember in the English, whenever Misty would summon Staryu or Starmie, it would just... Staryu would always be like, Ha! Huh! Like, he would just do the, Ha! Huh! And then Starmie would be a more feminine, like, Ha! Huh! Whenever she used the, the, the star Pokemon. And I like that. I like that, you know, cool thing there that they could use. Um, yeah. So, what's next? Uh, we have Mr. Mime! Mimeian, I believe, was the name in the Japanese. And it, its gender could be, later on, could be male or female. But regardless, Mr. Mime in the English. Mr. Mime! Um... Mr. Mime's little story arc, and I love that they keep bringing it back, because I remember every time we cut back to Palette, every time we see Ash's mom, Delia, Professor Oak, um, Casey, or whatever, we always see Mr. Mime hanging out, just helping out around the house. So, yeah, Mr. Mime was neat. I liked that. I, mean, I thought it would be cool if they could use him a little more, because it's literally a Pokemon. Like, Barrier is kind of an OP ability in the anime, anyway. Barrier's actually really badass, what Mr. Mime can do. Um, in the games, it's just, like, they it's like a defense buff for physical attacks but in the anime it's like literally a for it's like freaking bartolomeo's barrier fruit right so you definitely use mr mime a little bit more there scyther oh now we're talking um isn't scyther's japanese name just like oh what was it it's it's just like striker i think striker or strike i think it's just that like just strike but whatever it's like a giant praying mantis that has like scythe blades for arms 
yes. <laughs> yes, love me a Scyther. Probably the most badass bug. I, I would say on average, because I like Beedrill, but I would probably say more people gravitated towards Scyther growing up than Beedrill. Beedrill's still really cool, but Scyther really is. Just the sleek design, love Scyther, and love Scizor as well. Uh, Jinx. Um, Jinx, I don't think you could catch in red version. I think it was only red, I mean, the only blue version or the yellow version that you could catch Jinx, and I think it's the Seafoam Islands, so I never could catch a Jinx growing up. Uh, and I think also Jinx is the only, only pure ice type in, hold on, let me look here. Because in, in Gen 1, you have Articuno that's ice and flying, and I think all other ice types are also dual water, so I think Jinx is the only one that is pure ice. Ah, here's the J's. Here's the J's right here. Jinx. Jinx. Jirachi! Jinx. Uh, yeah, is ice... No, it's ice psychic. All right. I don't know where I got that from then. I don't... For some reason, I thought that it was... For some reason that... I don't know. Anyway, yeah, Jinx was all right. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Electrobuzz! Electrobuzz! Yeah! That episode with uh, Scyther and Electrobuzz and they had that war. That was actually, I think... The first Pokemon episode I ever watched. Because when Pokemon started airing, I couldn't start from episode one. And um, I couldn't start from episode one. And I had like a VHS tape that I found. Or I think I rented from a video store back when video stores were a thing. And I started watching that. And I think one of the first episodes was like Showdown in Dark City that I watched. And that was, or maybe it was like one of the episodes on the table. It wasn't the first one I watched. No, no. I remember this. I remember this. Okay. Brain, work overtime. The first Pokemon episode I ever watched in its entirety was Wake Up Snorlax. Because that VHS tape had Wake Up Snorlax on it, the first episode. Can't remember what the second episode was. And the third episode was the Showdown in Dark City episode with Electrobuzz and the, and the Scyther gangs, like, fighting each other. With the Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Okay. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's a little piece of, you know, teching trivia there for you. But Electrobuzz was cool. I liked Electrovire. Uh, Electrovire. Uh, Magmortar was cool, but Electrovire was my more favorite out of those evolutions, okay? It had, like, the giant, like, like the, um, like, electrical cables, like, just zapping off the thing. I love that. And then Magmar, of course. Uh, Magmar, I don't think you could catch in red. I, I don't remember. In fact, I'm being very, fr I remember being very frustrated you couldn't catch Magmar in red. Um, but yeah, Magmar was really cool. I love when Blaine used him, uh, against Charizard, and that was, like, that was, like, the big battle. Like, Magmar! versus Charizard and that was for the volcano badge and the seismic toss finisher that was that was pretty cool like Magmar but not as much as I like Pinsir Pinsir oh that's a tough one because I keep for Pinsir is the Pokemon that I kind of forget it exists but then I remember it's so badass and I don't know how that works you know you think like it's a Pinsir it's awesome but then like oh yeah, it's not a thing. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it is. It is awesome. Right, anyway. So, Pinsir, uh, giant, like, beetle Pokemon with just, not just the horns that, like, the clasp that, like, can, like, crush diamond or whatever, but also there's spikes there and that weird, like, alien insect mouth. It's disturbing, granted, if you saw this thing in the forest, you'd probably shit your pants and run in the opposite direction. I think it can fly, too. Doesn't it have wings? And it comes after you? Like, that thing is terrifying, right? But, um, yeah, if you're definitely looking to be the best like no one ever was and you gotta catch a bug type, no offense to you, Sklider, but I I'm gonna go with the Pinsir. Pinsir, Scyther, or Beedrill? Tauros. Uh, Tauros is a bull. Uh, the only reason I really care about Tauros is because of that episode that was cut from the anime in, in English because of the gun, uh, the Kaiser episode, which features Dratini and also features Ash catching a crap ton of Tauros. And so it kept getting brought up later on in the series. It's like, Ash has a bunch of Tauros. He has like 50 Tauros he caught. And it's just like, when did that happen? So it's like, yeah. Um, that's the reason I remember Tauros too much, but beyond that, not really so much. Uh, we got Magikarp and we got Gyarados. Kind of in the similar vein with Abra, I never really had the patience. Although I think I did evolve Magikarp once, because Magikarp at, at level 15 did learn Tackle, I remember. I think I remember I powered through it once, and I did evolve a Magikarp into a Gyarados. Um, but most of the time, even though I knew, Mag like from reading the books, I knew Magikarp evolved into Gyarados, and it happens early on in the anime. Um, but I still was just like, oh man, I can't, I can't do it, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, Gyarados though, the story of that plucky koi that makes it to the top of the waterfall and evolves into a mighty dragon, love it. And of course, later on we get Mega Gyarados, which finally uh, takes on, I think, the dragon typing. 
Uh, Gyarados is with a Y, right? Yeah. And then we got, yeah, Mega Gear. No, it's not a dragon. That's that's Charizard when Mega Evolves gets the dragon typing. Uh, Charizard X. Uh, Mega Gyarados is a water dark type, which, okay, cool. All right, staying true to the fish origins, I see. Okay, all right, cool. But Mega Gyarados, Mega Gyarados is pretty damn cool. Is pretty damn cool. All right, uh, what's next? We got Lapras. Love Lapras. I love the Lapras that was used in the Orange Island arc where it was just their transport from island to island and it just became part of the crew. What happened to that Lapras, by the way? Because did, did Misty keep it? Or did it go back to... Because I know, like, Casey was part of that arc. Did Casey take it? I don't think he did. Or did the Lapras just go on its separate way? Like, all right, everybody, you know, you, you helped us out. And, you know, we're, we did the Orange League and Ash won. The Lapras just sails off into the ocean because... Ash doesn't like keeping good Pokemon for very long. Uh, what's that? What's that Pokemon? What the hell is that? I have to zoom in. Oh, it's a Ditto. I saw like a little tiny speck. I have a chart of all of them right there. And I'm like, what is that Pokemon? Is that, that can't be the Porygon, right? No, it's a Ditto. All right. I love Ditto. Ditto is awesome. Ditto is the Pokemon that can become any Pokemon, of course. Um, and so unfortunately, not that great. J Rose did, uh, J Rose 11 did do a run of all Ditto. So I watched that episode. I love that. Um, but yeah, Ditto, I, I love in concept. I just loved if, if it would maybe a little bit more practical and battle use like when you use transform uh maybe don't just get the 5 pp in every attack maybe you could transform and get maybe 10 pp in everything that would be nice you know I, I know as much like if you throw a ditto out against lance's uh aerodactyl or whatever and it transforms into an aerodactyl it's not going to be as strong as lance's aerodactyl so maybe something to buff it to make it slightly stronger and i think maybe something like that does happen later on but yeah ditto in practice though not the great but i love the concept uh then we got the evolution so i get to skip over i get to take out like four of these at once all right the evolutions of course um my favorite evolution is umbreon i love umbreon close second is glaceon out of the original three i would probably go vaporeon easily because i kind of like gravitate toward water types as we've kind of already established um i always love making the the uh, reference of like you know, people love Eevee, and I love Eevee as well. Eevee's great. How annoying it would be to have any of the Eeveelutions as pets. So, like, for Vaporeon, for instance, it would be like this uh, cat animal that always is wet, always is soaking wet, and you have to keep it hydrated, right? Getting water everywhere. Um, you know, Jolteon is very spiky, so you couldn't cuddle with it. Imagine, like, having a cat, except it's a Jolteon. It, like, jumps up on your lap and just, like, spikes are, like, cutting into you. Uh, Flareon, do I need to go on? Flareon is literally a fire hazard waiting to happen. It's like, all right, Flareon, we're gonna go to the store and pick up some food. We'll be right back in 15 minutes. Come back, the whole house is just up in flames. Uh, Umbreon secretes poison. Uh, Leafeon wouldn't be too good in the, in the, uh, winter. It would freeze. Uh, and Glaceon, likewise, in the summer wouldn't be too good. It would melt. You have to keep Glaceon in your freezer in the summer months. Um, Espeon. Espeon seems like it would be okay. But anybody out there that owns a cat. All right. I want you to imagine it's your cat, but your cat also has psychic powers. Yeah. There would be no objects on any flat surface in your home. Your computer, your TV, you would leave and come back in an hour and everything would be knocked off. It's a cat with the psychic ability to move shit, all right? Yeah, no. Um, and um, and uh, Sylphion, I guess, would just be... The, the ribbons would get tangled and stuff, you know? Like, you have a fan or something in your house, and the the, the, the Sylphion walks by and just gets it tangled. Ah! It's like, I'm sorry, Sylphion, I'm sorry! So, yeah. But I like Vaporeon as my favorite evolution. Porygon! <sighs> Let me take a drink for this. Hold on. Porygon. Porygon, Porygon got, got the short end of the stick here. Out of the original 150, I think we can agree Porygon got the short end of that stick. Porygon is my favorite Pokemon. I love him. Uh, it might be because it goes back to the Digimon thing, because I really like Digimon, and Porygon is essentially a Digimon. He, the, the concept of a Pokemon being created in cyberspace. Like, that's so cool, because it's like, literally, that's how you transport Pokemon, like, through the computer network. Like, teleportation technology exists in Pokemon, and... There's a lot of times where it's like explained, like sometimes things get crossed or, you know, Pokemon get lost or something happens in the, in the machine. It wouldn't be a far cry to say that you could program a code for a Pokemon and then push a button and have it be created, right? 
Also, I was a really big fan of the show Cyberspace growing up. Remember that? Cyberspace, we're moving with uh, Gilbert Gottfried and uh, Christopher Lloyd. <laughs> Remember that? Remember that show? I think it's still on. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so that that whole idea of like Cyberspace and Digimon and a Cy, uh, a, not a cyborg Pokemon, a Pokemon made in cyberspace out of computer code, out of binary, that, that blew my mind. That was so fascinating to me. I love Porygon. But then... Um, Pikachu had to use its electric attack to shock some missiles, which caused- NOT CONNECTED TO PORYGON IN THE SLIGHTEST, BY THE WAY! Pikachu was the one that used the electric attack, Team Rocket were the ones that launched the missiles, and then, BOOM! 200-something Japanese school children have a seizure, and now we can't have Porygon anymore! Look, it was a really scary thing that happened. I can imagine parents- flipping out in Japan when there are kids having seizures and it's because they were watching a show that was supposed to be safe for children. Okay, that should never have happened. And it was a serious, serious incident in Japan. They took it extraordinarily seriously. Pokemon went off the air for a few months. They had PSAs. They had people talking about it. The Pokemon shock, as it was called. And they had to explain, like, this is what happened. We're sorry that this happened. It was really scary. That could have been the thing that could literally have tanked Pokemon. Like, that could have been a thing where it was just like, this show literally caused our kids to have seizures and be some of them had to go to the hospital. Some of them were really severe. Um, you know, some were more mild, but you know, it was it happened, period. That was the bad thing, right? So that could have tanked Pokemon in its like first season. Thankfully it didn't, and it continued on. Um, but I always felt bad that it's like, okay, good, then just make sure the animation department doesn't use the, the red and blue lights anymore, and we're good. You don't have to get rid of Porygon because of that. Porygon is innocent in all this, right? Just because Porygon happened to appear in the episode, I think it's because Porygon's color scheme is, well, it's more pink and blue, but red and blue. So I think maybe parents would look at Porygon and say, that's what caused it, you know? That's what caused it. That Pokemon that was red and blue caused the seizures, even though it didn't, and even though you could very easily just make sure the animation department doesn't do that anymore. New regulations were definitely put in place after the Pokemon shock, so that doesn't ever happen again. Um, but Porygon has to just be pushed to the side now. <sighs> Poor Porygon. Never had a chance. I think in the fourth movie, in the Celebi movie, in the opening scene of the Celebi movie, you see Porygon just kind of floating around in a back alley somewhere. <laughs> like, hi, Porygon. I miss you too. <sighs> Maybe someday. I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not up to date on new Pokemon episodes. Does Porygon 2 or Porygon Z ever show up in the anime again? I hope he does. Porygon, you're always going to be my favorite. I love you, Porygon. Okay, so uh, moving on to God, we have Ammonite and Amastar. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I always went the way of the dome. I always went the way of the dome growing up, so Kabuto and Kabutops. Any Pokemon that has Scythe Blades for hands, I'm sorry. It's immediately going to be the one that I'm going to go with. I'm going to pull up Kabutops. I'm going to pull up Porygon, too, for that matter. I pull up Kingdra, but I don't pull up Porygon. That's just a, that's just a uh, travesty here. Uh, Porygon, 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 Pidgeot! Mega Pidgeot! Uh, let's see here. Pinsir? Oh, yeah, Mega Pinsir. I told you, I thought it did have wings. There you go, check it out. Cool, cool. I ripped out some of it. I think, uh, oh, I remember what, oh, I remember why I did this, yeah. A few years ago, when I was still in college, when I was uh, at university, I was the president of the anime club there. And we had a thing called the, um, uh, what was it called? Um, oh, what was it called? Uh, it was like a fair that we had at the beginning of uh, the, the first semester of the year, the fall semester, uh, where we would have a fair where we would try to recruit new members to our clubs. The name is escaping me right now. But we had to make like a, uh, a, a big poster board, like a big poster board for, you know, the anime club. So we'd have a table and we'd like join the anime club. And so I was, because I was the president, you know, that one year, I was responsible for making it. So I remember I was like, oh, it'd be really cool to use Pokemon because maybe, you know, that, that would be the thing you would recognize. Like a lot of fans of anime, you'd recognize Pokemon because everybody knows Pokemon. So I'm like, I need images of Pokemon to put on this um, uh, poster board. And I didn't uh, have any printer ink at the time. So I'm like, oh, what else can I use? So I literally, I think I literally used this. 
So I just, I used Piplup, I guess. This is Piplup, I guess. I use that. But anyway, Porygon. Oh yeah, Porygon. Porygon was created from programming code, and it can return to that form to navigate cyberspace. It can literally digitize itself. It's a Digimon. I love it. Uh, it can't be copied like regular data, so... Yeah, and then you got Porygon 2, which is the upgraded version, and then Porygon Z to the next level. That's Porygon Z I love, because Porygon Z is Porygon if Porygon got hacked. It's like Porygon got hacked with, like, other data, and it became Porygon Z. So that's, I like the little evolutionary thing there. Uh, but where were we at? Yeah, Kabuto and Kabutops. Yeah, I gotta focus on those guys. Definitely. I love Kabuto and Kabutops. Kabutops is awesome. Long ago, Kabutops swam through ancient seas in search of food. Its legs and gills are the beginning and to adapt to life on land. Um, so, yeah, I loved uh, the idea of fossil Pokemon growing up. The idea of fossils just, like, taking an ancient Pokemon and reviving it. Gen 1 you could tell, had a lot of really clever ideas with that. They could have just taken random animals and then just made them into Pokemon, but they went with plants, they went with ghosts, they went with the fossil idea, like the resurrected Pokemon. And because there was 150 of these damn things, they could really go crazy with ideas. So I really love that. Uh, but yeah, Ammonite and Amistar are okay, and I think I used them once, but Kabuto and Kabutots were always my go-to. Uh, Snorlax, the, the lazy Pokemon. Snorlax was always awesome. You got two chances to catch a Snorlax in Gen 1 without trading, and uh, I, I sometimes I would fail both times. Sometimes I would fail the first and be like, okay, it's okay, I have one more chance to catch a Snorlax, and I would fail the second time and accidentally KO it when I'm trying to capture it, and I'd be like, no! But Snorlax was great, and I remember Snorlax, as I said, was the first Pokemon that I was ever really, like, the, the episode that focused on Snorlax blocking, like, a creek to get to a dam, or it was, like, basically damming up, like, a river, like a beaver would do, and so that was the episode where they had to go through and free that, and there was, like, this guy that was, like, singing a song to the Snorlax in the Poke Flute. I, I remember that episode. But, yeah, yeah, Snorlax, Snorlax is cool. You can't, like, not love Snorlax. Snorlax is just, like, sleeps 23 hours a day, but then wakes up and just hyperbeams your face off. <laughs> Snorlax. Uh, the Legendary Birds. Be honest with you. Um, they're cool. Articuno, easily my favorite. Although, oddly enough, I went, uh, Team Valor when I played Go. Uh, I don't know why I did that. I was I, Articuno is my favorite. I, our Moltres is actually my least favorite. Why the hell did I go Team Valor on that? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, Articuno is my favorite. But I'll be honest with you. Maybe when I was a kid, I thought like those legendary birds were like the coolest. But there's definitely been way cooler legendary Pokemon down the line. Like even the legendary dogs in the next gen were I think cooler than the birds, uh, than the burbs. Uh, but Articuno's great. Zapdos would be my second fave. And then Moltres. Moltres is just like, I, like just a fire bird. Like, it's a bird on fire. Okay. Eh, whatever. Um, I also love how Articuno has a very special place in Gen 1, uh, Seafoam Islands. You have to go into the depths of Seafoam, and you have to move the boulders around to find Articuno in the frozen depths of Seafoam Islands. Uh, Zapdos is at the back of an of a abandoned power plant in Kanto. So you have to go back there and fight through all the electrodes and shit, and you find a... Um, Find the Moltres roosting in this abandoned power plant. I mean, the Zapdos in this abandoned power plant. And then Moltres feels like they didn't know where to put Moltres, so they just threw Moltres on Victory Road. Like, you know there's a volcano at Cinnabar. I, I know there's, like, limited um, there's like limited data. They couldn't do that. And I know later on in Gen 3, when they rebooted Fire Red and Leaf Green, they used... Um, they used uh, Moltres there in, like, the uh, the Seven Islands or the Seven Islands or whatever the hell they called those. Um, but, yeah, Moltres has always just been bland to me because, like, it's a firebird, whatever. But Zapdos and Articuno are cool. And then the Dratini line. Love the Dratini line. Love dragons. And they're the only true dragons in the entirety of Gen 1. Uh, yeah, Cedra looks like a dragon. Charizard looks like a dragon. And freaking Gyarados looks like a dragon. None of them are dragons. I don't think Cedra is part dragon. Cedra part dragon? Oh, I'm pretty sure. Then again, I couldn't remember Cedra's name, so don't take my credit for... Oh, Rotom! Love me a Rotom. Uh, let's see what we got here. We're almost done here. Uh, Shellos. Sharpedo. Uh, Cedra. 
Cedra's no. Cedra is a dragon species, but it's just water. So yeah, yeah, those are the only true dragons. Um, I I like Dragonair the best. I mean, dra I mean, dra uh, Dragon Knight really cool. And I remember there was the Pokemon. There was like that YouTube series where they do the Pokemon Generations or whatever they call it, where they were animating various scenes from Pokemon. And I love those little those little mini sodes or whatever. In that mini sode, man, Lance's Dragonite is badass. It's like punching through walls and shit. I love that. Like that Dragonite, you don't mess with. But the Dragonite, the way it's depicted a lot of times in the books and in the game, it's just really like kind of dorky. You know, I always thought that. Uh, and I always thought Dragonair was so much more elegant. And it had like the gem on it and it could fire like blasts and like, you know, spins up the twisters or use hyper beam. I thought Dragonair was like the apex of dragon, at least in Gen, in Gen 1. Uh, but I like Dragonite as well too. Uh, and then Dr Dratini's pretty cute. Now we got the last two. We got Mewtwo, which here's the thing. So um, Mewtwo and Mew together. Um, all right. So I don't think I learned about the Mew glitch or the rumor with the truck or anything. I don't remember anybody telling me about that. I remember the first time because Mew was like a mystery to a lot of people, I think. But the thing is, I got into Pokemon not from day one. Like, other people were into it and watching the show when I came along, like, a little bit later. Um, and the movie was, like, I remember when I started getting into Pokemon, it was only, like, a month or two before the movie came out. Before Pokemon, the first movie, came out. So, that was one of my first big introductions to the franchise. And Mew plays a very central role there. So even though Mew was only added, like, I think the last two weeks into programming the game, um, and there's the whole rumor, how do you get Mew in the game? What's the glitch? What's the cheat? How do you do it? Is it behind the truck? What do you do? Um, that stuff, like, escaped me as a kid because one of the first things I saw was Mew and Mewtwo in the movie, right? Um, you know, Dan Green as Mewtwo, man, though, can you think of a better way? Can you think of a better character better voice actor here to like bring pokemon to life for like a little kid i was when did the first movie come out it came out in 99 right uh, let me check on that really quick i feel like that came out in 99 because the next movie was pokemon 2000 um but yeah as i as i looked that up um uh, that was like my first big introduction i was only five or six years old at the time and uh, that is one of my fondest childhood memories. And that's actually probably a good story, a little mini story to hear ended out here. Hold on. Pokemon, the first movie. Uh, 1998, it came out in Japan. But it was released in July of 1999, yes. And uh, I, I remember going to the movies that day, too. I remember with my parents taking me and walking into that theater. And it was packed. It was packed. Pokemania was at its height, man. And I remember my parents and every other parent was probably just like, well, what's going on? I don't understand this. But every kid in that theater was like, yeah! <laughs> and then here's the story. That wasn't the story. Here's the story. It took about maybe six months or so for a movie to be released in theaters for it to be a home release for VHS. DVDs weren't a thing yet. Um, so you had to wait a while. And there was no streaming and there was no way you could watch it. So it's literally you see it in the movie theater and then if you want to see it again, you have two options. You can either go to the movies and see it again, which I don't think my parents would like to go do back that back to that again. Or you wait like six, seven months or whatever long it takes for it to get a home video release and you get the VHS. So I love Pokemon at this point. So cut to like probably close to around Christmas 1998. And uh, I'm loving Pokemon and I'm checking the thing. And my mom worked at Walmart. So I'm like, you know, when, do you know when it's going to come out? And I'm checking the release date. And it's like, I can't remember the exact date, but I marked it. And I'm like, this is the day it comes out, right? And so I was really, really excited. Uh, we're going to go do this, right? And so I, I asked my dad to go and buy the movie for me while I was at school. I remember that. I remember that. I'm like, Dad, you got to go to Walmart. You got to buy the video. Please buy the movie. I want to watch it again tonight. And my dad's like, okay, okay, I'll do that. So I go to school. I was in, uh, 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 no, not even kindergarten at this point yeah i was probably in kindergarten at this point damn and so i come home from kindergarten and i'm like dad 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 did you buy it did you buy it and my dad was just like oh no i uh, forgot and i'm like dad no and he's like well we have to go to walmart right now and buy it <laughs> and my dad's like okay okay go upstairs go upstairs and you know change and change into your like, like jacket or he asked me to go upstairs to grab something like put on your jacket it's cold or whatever so i'm like okay so i go upstairs and i put on my jacket and i go upstairs and on my bed was 
a Pokemon the first movie VHS. So I got home from school and I told my dad, blah, blah, my mom and my dad had put the thing on my, on my bed. So when I ran upstairs to see it, it was sitting there on my bed and I'm like, <gasps> and then I ran back over to the stairwell and I always remember this. I remember the image of at the bottom of the stairs, my mom and my dad were there standing like with their arms around each other, just like looking up at me and smiling. And like, cause they were like, oh my God, he's going to see that. And he's going to freaking just explode. He's going to love it. So, um, I went to the stairwell. I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much. And they're like, yeah, then watch your movie. And I'm like, yay. And I even had, I had a Pikachu VCR. I had a Pikachu VCR, like a Pokemon VCR. And the remote was a Pikachu. If I could find pictures of that, I'll show you that too. I don't, I've lost it, but it was literally a Pikachu remote. It was like a, a stuffed animal Pikachu, like a plushy Pikachu that you could like the butt the butt flap opened and you could take out like the battery pack and then like on the top of pikachu like you push down on pikachu's head and it was like a remote <laughs> i remember that um but yeah yeah that's pokemon but yeah mewtwo and mew man you know beautiful way to introduce like pokemon to me as, as a little kid so that was me going through every single pokemon in a video that i thought was just gonna be eh just a little video that I'm gonna do. I'm probably not gonna edit this too extensively. <laughs> hey everybody, editing teching here. Had to stop the video right there because that, at this point in the editing process, is the funniest joke that has aged insanely well. Because let me tell you, I finished uh, uh, filming this video, it was like 9.30 at night, and I spent about until 1 o'clock in the morning editing it, so that's like another three, three and a half hours. Then I finally went to bed, woke up the next morning, today, and I resumed editing at 10. It is now almost 1 o'clock p.m., so that's probably close to about six hours of editing. Yep. <laughs> although I messed up a few times, so I'm going to have to go back and edit a little bit and I'm going to add some stuff in. Um, but yeah, this was a lot of fun. It was a little long, but it was fun. Um, hey, hey, Megala Doug, how are you doing? That was an hour and a half. Hour and a half. Last time I made a video that long was, I think, the uh, the Hunter Hunter video where I did all the uh, Greed Island cards. Man, all right, I'm hungry. Uh, all right, so anyway, I'm going to go get some Farfetch'd. Actually, have you ever had duck? It's kind of greasy. I actually didn't like it that much. I tried it once. I cooked it. It was it was kind of greasy. I'm not a fan. But anyway, um, thanks for watching this. I hope you enjoyed my big epic Pokemon special. And if you like this, let me know. Uh, Gen 2 only has, I think, 100 new Pokemon, so it would be definitely um, you know, a shorter video. And I might be able to do Gen 3 too, but beyond that, uh, that's like Pokemon I didn't really grow up with, so I wouldn't really be able to give you my opinion on them too much. Like, what was my opinion on freaking, let me try to flip, what was my opinion on this thing? No, not Lugia. Lugia's awesome. Lunatone's cool too. But what was my opinion on Lum Lumineon, the Neon Pokemon? Um, it's, um, it, it looks like a fish that's like really chill. Looks like a fish that just swims around and just, you know, just like, hey guys, how you doing? I'm a Luminion, just I'm a Lumi Neon. You want to pronounce it however, man. It's cool. It's all chill down here in the ocean. All right, so I think that's my cue to head out. But thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching and Barry and my Pokemon team. Uh, Starman, Dice, sk sk I forget what I called you, Skeleton Spider, Megaladug, and, um, and, and, and Celebi signing out later.